Okay, so we are back and this is take two on this video as the announcements ran long and absolutely murdered my first attempt. So what we're going to do, we're going to be talking about another guy today in our series and we're focusing on Mr. Deemer. And Mr. Deemer, he's well known for a couple of gambits that share his name. And keep in mind, again, a gambit is giving up material in order to gain time to attack faster. There's an interplay of advantages in chess, and players who enjoy gambits like taking risks. They're more on the aggressive side. So, we're going to dive right in with a game by Mr. Deemer, who was a chess master, I believe, from Germany? Anybody know this flag? Germany. Germany. Yeah. I knew somebody in here would get it. So, he's a chess master from Germany, and he loved unorthodox openings like the Deemer Dumb Gambit, D-U-H-M, D4, D5, E4, E6, C4, which is kind of interesting, and the Alapin Deemer Gambit, D4, E6, E4, D5, Bishop, E3. Not a big fan of that. I believe I hammered that in uh, my book, Mastered the French, and also the first one, too. And then last, we have, uh, he's most famous for what we're going to be looking at today, his refinements of the Black Mar Deemer Gambit. And basically, Black Mar was the last name of a dude who was working on it, and this guy came along and played so many games with it and did so well with it that... They added the dash and put his name on it, too, out of respect because he played it so much. At least that's what I think. Now, we're going to dive right in. And remember our principles of a good opening. Maintain a pawn in the center, develop your knights and bishops effectively, and castle. So let's see how well he does these things with this idea of the gambit in mind. So first of all, we get a pawn in the center. And then on the next move... He goes, take my pawn for free. This is the traditional move of the Black Mar Deemer Gambit. And here, Black has a few options. You can capture, or you can protect. So, accepting a Gambit would be capturing. But, if someone was to say, play E6 you would transpose it into the French defense. Or C6, transpose into the Karl Kahn. Neither one of those are bad options. And if you play one of those openings, I'd strongly recommend going into that because it's a moral victory. If somebody's playing a gambit against you, if you can force them into a different type of game and not allow them to gambit, typically that's, you know, that moral victory that you're not giving them what they wanted with the style of play that they wanted to play in. So... Well, Mr. Christian Beck, who was Mr. Deemer's opponent in this game in 1980, decided to grab the pawn. And this is going to be good. So, we're going to develop and attack this pawn in the center. And Black defends it. Now, there are some lines would say, the bishop comes out here, we grab eventually, and we get our pawn back. But Mr. Deemer isn't interested in this type of play. He wants to go for more. He says, take my pawn again. Here's another one. So now Mr. Deemer is a pawn down, but he's given away the F pawn. Now, when he castles later, this rook will be on an open file. This bishop's probably going to come here to be able to attack. And Mr. Deemer is banking that his attack for his pawn will be good enough that he will get something more than his pawn in return. He's going to cash in later. Now, if his opponent plays solidly and just trades pieces, Mr. Deemer's going to be down a pawn and he's going to lose the end game. So, can we understand how this is a little bit risky? He's basically saying, I've got to win in the middle game, otherwise I will lose in the end game. Okay? So, G6 was played, which is definitely not one of the best lines. And in the database, Mr. Deemer scored 93% in his career from this position. So, meaning, 
If he played 100 games, he won 93 of them. So pretty beastly stats. Very simple, bishop c4, again, hitting that weak point on f7. And it kind of looks like white's cheating, right? Because he's got three pieces out, and black only has one. And the attack just keeps coming. Our extra time, we're trying to make it count. So he's got to defend this. And there's a common mistake that I see with, with a lot of players. They'll go, well, I've made all these moves. I'm going to take on f7. Well, what's more valuable, the knight and bishop, or the rook in this scenario. Rook and pawn, rather. Yeah, the knight and bishop, but why? Anybody have any idea? Yeah. Those can capture better. Those can capture better. Okay, that's, that's an idea. Let me add to that some. Now, notice how our knight and bishop are very aggressive pieces. Remember when we're talking about the advantages of chess? Remember the third one was quality? Well, these are excellent quality pieces because they have lots of options and they're making threats. These are passive pieces that only defend. When you're trading active attackers for passive defenders, you're ruining your attack. And if Mr. Deemer has given up a pawn for play, he doesn't want to just trade down. He wants to keep momentum, keep pressure until he can attack something so much he's getting something for free. So trading when you're down material is a bad concept. You want to keep the tension to keep fighting, hoping that your opponent makes a mistake. Now, Mr. Deemer continues his development. And remember our principles of good opening play, develop those knights and bishops, check mark on that. And he's going to be castling soon. Boom. So Mr. Deemer has completed development, but notice Black's position. He's having trouble getting his bishop on c8 out. And he's a little bit lagging behind here. So he pushes the pawn up. And white goes bishop b3, mostly to stop any sort of b5 nonsense or anything with that. Bishop's on a good square now. And... This is an interesting stutter step because they repeat moves. And do you know what happens if we repeat moves three times? Nope. That is draw by three times repetition. It has to be the exact same position. It's not just like, well, my king went back and forth three times, but he's doing all different types of other moves. That's not a draw. Notice how in this case, if black was to play queen c7, that would be threefold repetition if white went bishop g5, because you had the exact same position on the board three times. Make sense to everybody? So, Mr. Deemer was in a fighting mood today. He was not interested in a draw, so he decides to deviate and go queen f3. Now, I've looked at a lot of games, and I've had students ask me before, well, why would somebody repeat twice and then do something different? Because it's to see if the other guy will do something different too. And also, in modern uh, FIDE time controls, which is the World Chess Federation, it's typically 30-second increment, meaning every time you make a move, you get 30 seconds added to your clock. So can you see the benefit of quickly repeating the position twice? You get an extra thinking time of a minute to work with. So a lot of players do this as like professional technique to gain a little bit of time, and then they continue and do something else because they're trying to win. So at this point, uh, I'd like to show Black's improvement. He definitely needed to clip right here. Go check. And there's some stuff to calculate, but after knight h5, White really can't hold his extra material together. It's all this pressure. A pawn is lost, and then since White couldn't trade, he's now down two pawns. Black should be able to consolidate this position. Black is better. Well, Mr. Deemer's opponent, he decided to try to keep tension in a weird way. He plays knight b6. Well, Mr. Deemer defends his pawn, and now every single one of White's pieces is in the attack. The dynamic potential of the position is at its peak. And again, we're trying to keep 
pieces. The guy's able to trade one set, but he doesn't exactly have a plan. Now this next move is what White's been waiting for. Black plays bishop e6, and this move is horrendous. It ruins your pawn structure. What was better was bishop f5, and black's at least equal. But after bishop e6, we are able to take, and now that pawn is going to be weak and very difficult to defend. So now that we have a target, that's what he's going to focus on. Queen h3. Notice how the queen is giving a little, little tickle tickle to the pawn. So black's got to defend. Now he's pushing his pawns to try to attack the queen to get the lady out of there. So black's trying to stop it. Notice how the pressure just keeps mounting. Now that pawn is pinned. If the pawn moves, the queen drops. We move the rook from the open file, so if this knight moves, the rook and queen will pile up on the pawn. Now, we would like to take here, but the queen will take our rook, and if, from points-wise, a queen is worth nine, a rook's worth five, be ten for nine, that type deal. So we don't want to have that opportunity, right? So white simply moves his rook up. So now if takes, it would only be a queen for rook special, and that is special. So knight d5, and that's where it gets broken. A piece is in hand at this point. The rooks are coordinated on this open file. No weaknesses. Now we're trying to trap this rook because the rook really doesn't have many good squares to go to, so he has to sacrifice. Black's down a huge amount of material, and after bishop takes e7, Mr. Beck had enough in the position and resign because white is a full rook up and will be able to consolidate the position very easily. Now, we're at that point after the first nine weeks that I always appreciate showing quality games to students and having you know, a little story behind it because think many of you barely knew peace movement nine weeks ago. And now you can look at a game between at least one master, I can't verify that both players were masters, and understand what you're looking at and even mildly appreciate it in some cases. So if you have that question of what we've learned so far, I think that answers it somewhat. That's it for this video.